Hey, what's up? This is Jedi Steve, and this is Johnny. Um, information down below if you want to, not yet, but after I do this video, after we do this video. So we want to talk about Wonka. And this is kind of our loose concepts about the, the, the movie um, from his, his, his frame. So I want to do a spoiler alert, but we're not sure. We're thinking possibly you watch the movie once. And then if you want to watch it again, you kind of look at some of the concepts that, that, that we are going to be doing from, from two different worlds, some worlds that overlap. So uh, go ahead and tell the audience about yourself. Yeah. Uh, so I basically, um, uh, I have my own business doing design, uh, marketing. And uh, before that, had a background doing accounting and finance. Um, I don't know. It's like I like the outdoors. I <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, you know, I like the ocean. I like the girls to have blonde hair. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much. I like skating and stuff like that, and traveled from Florida, uh, other side of the country, and um, eventually made my way to here and then met Jedi Steve. So awesome, awesome. So we both saw the the Wonka movie. You saw it, and then then I then I didn't even know it was in theaters, and then I went a, went ahead and saw it. Mm -hmm. And we want to talk about concepts and bring it towards business and branding and identity of 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 your brand and how to take things to the next level. And when we're in the process of always taking things to the next next level and working on that. So what are some ways? To, to do that and some things that are inside the box and some things that are outside of the box. So what was your number one takeaway from the movie? Um, uh, the importance of dreaming. The importance to dream. So there's that one point that was early in the movie when he, when he uh, not first first got to that town, but he had, he, he got there and the police officer said no, no daydreaming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. He did say that, didn't he? And that's one thing that is uh, dirty. People give us dirty looks to, mm -hmm. to keep us from dreaming. People yell at us, and sometimes they're violent to keep us from, from dreaming. For sure. Um, to that, that extent. Um, what, what are some of the experiences of people killing your dreams when maybe you're younger, and what are some of the strategies that you keep yourself from that happening now? Yeah, yeah. So I think a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of indoctrination that happens when you're a kid from family, uh, probably being the most impactful because those are people you kind of like learn to trust, friends. Uh, and then, of course, this little bubble of similar minded people, which is natural for people to do. So your role models end up looking like that, too. Um, and that just translates to suppressing your ability to dream outside of that bubble. And whether they mean to or not, their limited views of things, whether it be intentional, not that it's intentional, but whether it be from uh, they're happy where they're at and it's not in alignment with where you want to be, or they just are in like fear state, right? And they're just always like, no, you can't do more than this. Uh, that constant reinforcement from them and everyone else in that same, in that bubble uh, it crushes your dreams, even if they're not saying it directly to you. Just that fact that you're around that all the time. For sure. And just like an example, we're we're all two two years old, and we're sitting in the car and we're we're by a curb, and there was many times that our parents had to incite fear in ourselves to keep us from running into off the sidewalk into the street, hmm. and that that fear. Is it's not it's this 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 whole body that we have is, is we have our brain and we have it's a lot of it's mental but a lot of it's physical a lot of it is that fear goes into to yourself because you imagine like a, a two year old will run in the street and get hit by a car mm -hmm. if you if if you don't do that for sure the challenge is how do you break past that fear that was that was put through and a bunch of lies that were sold to you to keep you from running into the street at age two how do you break out of that at age 22 at age 32 at age 42 mm -hmm. and that's always the challenge a lot of times because they also have a rules in, in business a mm -hmm. lot of rules in in in, in business mm -hmm. so one thing i want to say and then make sure that we get back into the wonka movie is is uh in the there's a book and a play called The Death of the Salesman. 
And in The Death of the Salesman, there's a guy that's a, been in sales for a long period of time that the movie's about. And he's, he's ha waiting, he's like in his 60s and he's waiting for that one last sale before he gets out of it. And he's talking about one of his sons. One of his sons followed his line in business, was real good in business. Another one of his sons went into the, to his office when he was a kid and he was whistling in the elevator. <laughs> so one of the people at the office said, he'll never be good in business because he whistles in the elevator. What is whistling in the elevator? Everything I fucking do. <laughs> because I saw that and I was like, oh, like, what's like, because there's so much etiquette in business. Mm. And sometimes when you follow etiquette, you can't take it to the next level. For sure. Yeah. But all, all, the, but still, they're doing like very devious shit, mm. but they're, they have their spoon and fork totally properly, but they're doing very devious shit. Mm, right. Yeah. For sure. I'm talking like I don't even know which fork to use, and I went to eight and a half years of Catholic school and everything like that. But I do real good, good, good things in this world, and I aim to do it more and more. So that's that's a that's a challenge for things. So so uh, in the movie, I'm gonna go to the the church. So in the movie, they they had this church, and this church, and I'm and and I was thinking it was like the Vatican, mm. and. They were siphoning out in their business, which I think is poor integrity. They were they were selling the bad chocolate. They mm -hmm. didn't want to sell the best chocolate mm -hmm. because they felt that it wouldn't be good for their business. And they were they were hoarding that chocolate in the bottom of the, the like the Vatican, <laughs> yeah. just like Mother Teresa. She has all the everybody's like Mother Teresa. She's so amazing. She has these people dying in her arms when they could have sold the gold that was in the Catholic Church that they stole from mm -hmm. a lot of regions. Mm -hmm. They could have they could have sold that gold and fed the children instead of them dying in Mother Teresa's arms. Mm -hmm. Right, that makes sense. So she's like a pacifier for that. So going back to the what did the, the and my that was kind of deep and less less businessy, but what what did the, the, the chocolate mean to you? Uh yeah, I think that the the chocolate was represented more like a physical form of uh, of power through uh, mind control because they can have a degree of like scarcity mindset from the job of, of good chocolate I guess um, and uh, I would I would say see the thing I thought the thing about it is like there's a degree of truth behind it uh, that's not necessarily bad or evil, I would say. Like, the way they hid their books and stuff to hide the chocolate, the fact they had the chocolate down there. Um, but it was when they took it further and started suppressing competition, which was killing uh, adversity in the market. There was someone who had much better chocolate and much better product and even better customer service. They cared about the customer, right? Um they're suppressing it and i think a, phys a physical representation of that was was the chocolate which i mean at some point wonka would have needed to do the same thing to be to be fair um in order to build what he built eventually but it comes from a very different place he wants he genuinely cares about trying to do the best for everyone else so that's kind of how I, how I viewed it. I think it was it was that paired with their intentions with everyone else that made a lot of problems. So there's 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 always a there's always a challenge of of integrity, and some people have different morals and and, and integrity. Um, there can be diluting your product to a certain extent because mm -hmm. say say you had some tor so, sort of, sort of medication that people could take once. And they would be healed for life, mm -hmm. and then, or you would have something that you would have to dilute it. That they would be doing it on an everyday basis. There's always a challenge for that. And then there's there's extremes all the way till to going to a, a, a Epstein Island situation, being on a list to that. That's like a that's a, a very far stream. But sometimes people don't even know how to decipher and judge somebody that's that's diluting a project product to a certain extent and then somebody that's going to Epstein because one's like so overwhelming that we don't even know how to necessarily look at it and mm -hmm. we don't even necessarily have the full truth of it because that person might share some beliefs that we that we have to a certain extent for sure so going back to you remember the the police officer who they bought him off 
Right. Yeah. And he was. He was. He was. I took. I took that as one of the uh, seven deadly sins. Mm. And for for me, um, the original name name for sin was when you miss the perfect target in the middle of a like you have the target that you play darts. You know, mm. you get the perfect target in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Anything outside of that is a sin. Mm. That was that was the the <laughs> met. So when you don't feel that you're whole, complete, and perfect, and you're amazing, and you can do things at an amazing level. Mm-hmm. Then, then, uh, then you're, it's a, it's a sin if you don't believe that you're whole. And a lot of times religion, like, will, will, will shame us from that because, oh, you did this or you came from this family or you, you came from this and they'll shame you to a certain extent from some, something opposed to, to doing it. So one of the seven deadly sins is gluttony. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people think that's just being fat, but I would say all the seven deadly sins have to do with comfort. So mm-hmm. a lot of people in business are comfortable, mm-hmm. and I believe comfortable gets away in the way of being able to take things to the next level. For sure. And that's one of the reasons why I don't wear a jacket, and I take cold showers, but also I don't measure my success by how often I don't have. I haven't worn a jacket in eight years in San Diego, and that I don't. I don't. I take cold showers. I don't measure my success like that. I measure my success on what benefits being uncomfortable is giving me so if i'm not showing up and and getting and making things happen and letting things happen if i'm not showing up and doing that it doesn't matter that i'm taking cold showers and all that stuff mm-hmm. it's 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 so comfortable have you thought about times in your life or seeing in others when when them being too comfortable has gotten in the way yeah i mean it happens with most people yeah even like entrepreneurs i mean i think Typically, people start off uncomfortable, you know, when they're young and have d- big dreams and goals and what, which basically is a form of discomfort because it means they want more than where they're at right now. Um, and then they either achieve them and they get comfortable, they get close enough and they get comfortable, or they never achieve it and they get comfortable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? For sure. Uh, and that's the same thing with the difference with people who are successful financially is just their discomfort level where they considered comfort to be was a much higher standard than other people. So for them, making a million dollars a year, they are uncomfortable as hell until they get to that point. Or maybe it's 200, maybe it's 500. And usually it's like circumstances, environment dictate a lot of that. They're around other people who are making that much. So it made them uncomfortable that they weren't making that much. And then they get comfortable, and whatever their systems and processes are that got them there, they just keep them there. And then you end up where, where we're at now. We have these businesses that can't operate in today's world because the people who own those businesses have been comfortable in the way they do things. Much like everyone else. You go to your job, you're happy with your with your apartment. It's the same thing, you know. But then if you don't exercise, you don't diet, you don't push further, then as you get older, you're like, oh, I'm not going to make retirement. Oh, I'm out of shape. Well, yeah, because you were comfortable with what you had. And that's why, you know, and the same thing with them. And, uh, yeah, so anyways, and, and, and actually one other thing I'd say about that is there's really no, there's no, uh, there's no stagnant, really. You're either improving or you're declining. You don't really stay stagnant for very long. So it's like if you're comfortable doing the same thing, what's going to happen is eventually you're going to start to deteriorate. Uh, you eat the same stuff and you don't exercise, you'll stay plateau for a while. Let's say you're 20, 29, and then what happens when you're 25, 27? You start gaining weight. And same thing with your business. It's working now, markets shift. What happens to the money? It starts to, you start to lose pro- start to lose profit, you start to lose employees, and you're not changing with the times kind of thing. So it's like, and then, you, and then you start to sabotage. Yeah, then self sabotage. Yeah, yeah. And now you're, now all you're waiting for is for things to deteriorate to a point where you're un- so uncomfortable now that you're back in the cycle of discomfort, make adjustments, change, push, or you never really want to a tackle. You never reach a deep enough discomfort to actually tackle the real issues that have probably been going, keeping you you're in some form of comfort for five years, 10 years or more. Uh, and you don't have reach enough discomfort to overcome that. And then you just implode, you know? Is there, is there anything else in the, 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 the at this point? Anything else that this reminds you of in the, the Wonka movie or 
I mean, yeah, those guys who were running a little mafia thing, they were comfortable. They didn't want to. They didn't want to lose their position because they could sit there and have their little drinks and have their money and own the town uh, comfortably. And what made them uncomfortable was Wonka coming in there and shaking all that up. It changed their comfort zone into something that now required them to do something made them very uncomfortable and their reaction to becoming discom uncomfortable was not to become more competitive it was to kill the competition yeah yeah that's basically the fastest easiest way to bring it back to the way it was not to grow from it and get better but yeah. to instead be like how can i keep things the same and with the least amount of effort i'll just kill him yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've all we've all had that thought. No. But but it's it's for me that should be exciting. Mm. That should be exciting the fact that 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 you're at a certain age and then you're feeling, "Oh, I can also make a, a, a transition." Um there's there's a there's a time in our in our lives that uh Christmas was the next day and we were so excited about Christmas. Mm. Now that same excitement is stress. Uh -huh. For, for a lot of us yeah, in, in yeah. times and I'm, and I'm not absent of, of stress I mean I definitely I definitely uh, have a practice to to do that but I, I try to only align with purposeful stress but sometimes sometimes little things just all of a sudden stress me out it's weird like sometimes the, a lot of times the bigger things don't stress me out like the little things <laughs> um, so there's there, there there is that challenge in that cartel but I think it should I should I think it should it, it should you should be excited about that um, that, that one of the one of the things. Go ahead, and, go ahead and grab that. Uh, why and you could finish what you're saying. The play-doh that's on the side by the crystals. Down, 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 down. So one one of the things that that uh, in the the Bible and I'm again I'm spiritual. I'm not religious. It says that Jesus told the apostles to be childlike, and I believe like that's why a lot of times. And this is a great thing for your business meetings. Grab yourself some play-doh. It's very cheap. And as you're just having just have your normal business meetings and then just like have each person playing with Play-Doh as you're having your, your business meeting, it changes. It's enough chaos. It's enough, enough uncomfortable for a, a traditional structured business. It's enough uncomfortable to, to keep you mindful and keep you present to what's going on. And we're, and we're truly happy when we're creating. Mm. And uh, if you see children, they're really happy when they're creating. And we're, we're all children. Um, we're, we're, we're grown, we, we, we evolve and everything, but child, there's a difference between childlike and child lit, childish. Childish is when we're out of balance, childlike is when we're aligned to a certain extent. Because for me, if I'm not having fun in a project, even if, even if it's like something that's a, a deep dark thing that I'm working on, if I'm not having fun and enjoyment in a project, then I sabotage. Hmm then it's hard to then then i'm going to burn out in a shorter period of time mm -hmm. because i'm not doing that and there, there's another thing is a kazoo this is a play this and when you play this you start to move in different directions because business wants you to be very stoic mm -hmm. but this that you're we're not only carrying information in our in our in our brain we're carrying it in our hearts and our gut a lot of business saying oh we don't want people that are emotional which what it, the truth is you don't want people that their emotions are out of balance. And how do you keep from having your emotions out of balance? You channel into your emotions on a consistent basis. Hmm. When yeah. you try and stuff them out, that's when you get out of balance and you just like freak out and just push, push yourself out of, out of your body. You're trying to stuff yourself in your body. You're pushing yourself out of your body. Hmm. And a lot of people get away, get heal this with, working out, doing a lot of different things, but sometimes they're channeling into more anger and more repressed anger based on the workout that they're doing. So having a, a balanced practice that, that, are, that you're able to, to do that. So pick up some of this and pick up a kazoo and these two things will, will, will change, your, change your life. And there's lots of breathing in here. We're, too, too many people in business are, are in their heads hmm. and a good way to get out of your heads is, is to breathe because you're, you're, you're getting in your heart and your gut. You're, there's more thinking, science is caught up to this, there's more thinking going in your heart and your gut than there is in your brain, each, each individual one. And there's no, a lot of thinking going on in your individual cells. 
does your brain communicate things more? But if you're not in tune with the three centers, then then yeah, your brain can com communicate how you're feeling, but it's like doing it in a superficial sort of way. I kind of went to a lot of stuff on that. <laughs> okay. Um, any anything else with 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 Wonka that that you experienced? Um, yeah, this kind of goes on what you were saying just now. Um, the pe I found that the people that are the most successful in business and uh, as a person, like in life, I think a lot of people have this like uh, compartmentalized view of uh, of success. That's obviously really skewed. Like a lot of these business people you're talking about are, are, are basically corporate. They're corporate mindset. It's not that they're corporate that they necessarily work corporate. I'm talking about like the corporate mindset, which is basically it's all basically coming up with numbers and not connecting with the work, not connecting with the craft, not connecting with the people. Very disconnected. It's all coming from this very toxic external place. Um, that uh, has to do usually with like control it's your typical very insecure individual someone who needs to control others needs to control situations needs to have a lot of external validation a lot of the security comes external and it manifests unfortunately our society has allowed it to manifest to like some very high levels of toxicity where they can run an entire business strictly based off of motivation to control people and to control uh, to have lots of money for external validation to basically have this entitlement of all this kind of craziness and society will actually let them like control people which is crazy I mean to a degree because technically those people don't have to work there <laughs> yeah, yeah. you don't have to work for a dude who's doing that or a girl you may feel that. you may feel like you do yeah you, you might feel it but yeah, yeah. you, you don't feel, you yeah. don't you know and that's you giving away your own power in that sense but and the way we know that because that that is I believe if we don't acknowledge that we don't aren't happy working at that place it's going to be taken away from us at some point and sure. and and most of us land on our feet when all of a sudden something's taken from taken away from us like that so that's how that's how we know that you don't have to work at that place for sure and it's, it's just acknowledging toxicity toxic relationships you know it's a big one like a lot of people don't have clear views of that and the views of like just a relationship with an employer is a very the standard is is a toxic standard that people don't realize is, is not in their best interest. But point being, um, that is a very fine example of, of an individual who is very lost, uh, lives a very miserable life, usually, um, and is not someone you want to look up to just because they make millions of dollars. I would say someone who's much better and is much better at business. They usually are great role models, great leaders. Everyone that works with them looks up to them. The clients they pick are ones that also picked them uh, and they get together really well. They know the things they enjoy and the things that they don't enjoy. The things they don't enjoy, they tend to give to other people who do enjoy them because those people are going to do better. And what do these people look like? They don't look like corporate business etiquette people like what uh, Josh Steve's talking about. They look like if they like, if they're truly into outdoors, you know what they're coming into work as to when they come in to run their business. They typically have boots, jeans, they have uh, usually like some kind of like, like a, looks like they're ready to go chop some wood. They probably have a beard. They probably are tatted up. They probably did go chop some freaking wood. You know, the way yeah. they talk is like that. And you know what the great, the best part about that is the customers love that kind of person because they reflect who they are or who they want to be. And the same thing goes with every business they work with. Who are those, who are the products, the businesses they're going to be doing business with? It's probably going to be tents uh axes right you know outdoor equipment outdoor clothing and if those people are just as passionate about it as well which typically those individuals only want to work with others who are really into their products and into their lifestyle like that because they really know it really well uh they're all going to get along really well and create something amazing right so 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 uh and and, and uh, it's like keywords on steroids <laughs> So, so if, if I was working on a marketing campaign, I would think of like keywords to attract the right type of people, but it's, it's more of like a three dimensional. It's like living, like embodying those words. Cause words aren't just, just words, they're energy. For sure. So yeah. it's like, you're attracting that on a, on a whole nother level. Cause so a lot of times people are staying away from what 
by the book business is telling it them and it's saying just focus on the bottom line but mm -hmm. focusing on the bottom life look at business as a sphere not a bottom line mm -hmm. and if you cultivate that sphere in the right way the bottom line will take care of itself yeah, and even bottom line doesn't even make any sense these are finance people these are people who only look at money like a lot of these people who are corporate you know, have the corporate mindset who are not the the healthy individual I just described. They don't care about the product, most of them. Even if they're a finance person, their product is finance. Most of them aren't even that. They just picked up finance or accounting or it could be uh, just investing. They might not be, usually investors are finance guys. Um, because it made money. It came from the same place. It came from external. I know I want the car, I want the girl, I want to have the nice house, I want external, external, external. I want to be able to be respected. I want to know if I say to do something, they have to listen to me because nobody listens to me. Like, they're not even, you know, none of that had to do with, I want to know how money works. I love learning about money. I love learning about how the numbers work, how how it taps in this, this intrinsic value that has energy, that moves throughout the universe, that we call money. It, they didn't say any of that. That's not what they're thinking. So when they say they're finance, they're not even that. Because a true finance guy can come in there, and these guys are the true finance guys. A lot of them are multi-billionaires. And when you talk with them, they don't even care about money. They're just so fluid with it. They're just like, whatever. But most of the people that we associate with that are not even finance people. They're not Basically, the standard has become really like everything else, right? 90%... No one wants to put themselves in this category, and I'll be the first to say I'm in this category as well, in, in one shape or another, are average at things in general. Whether you're 90% you're, you're average at, and in relationships, or you're 90% you're average in your work or your job, whatever. All of us fit that in some shape or form. And the same is true for business. So when we think the standard of business is this, you're thinking about the 90%, which is the average, what makes average? People don't actually care to go deep on it and actually understand it and, and produce something from a spiritual place. Because the top 10% go deep and it's, I, I, they identify with what they're doing. That's not the 90%, right? And that's how come the standard in business is this corporate mindset because these are people that don't go deep on things. They're very toxic. They just want to quick. They're, they're thinking like most, what would generate average results. The only difference is, in their world, average is nine million a year or whatever. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? And it's done through these really, really incredibly, they're not even clever. They're like building it off of other people and controlling them or killing the competition. That's not hard. That's not something that requires you to go deep on it and have, create something amazingly complex and, and uh, at a premium level. It, I don't know if that makes sense. And I, the best way to clarify it is like when you look at like most people, if they look at a car, they don't really understand it well enough to know why that car is a top 10% car versus that car. Aside from what they're told, oh, it's a Lamborghini. Versus, if I just took that away and said, it's a Toyota, you're like, why is that the top 10? You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know there was all these crazy mechanics on the hood that make it vastly different. Oh, but it's not selling around the world. It's like, no, it's not. It's sitting right there. It's an average, It's sitting here like every other average car. You just don't know. It's the same thing in companies. Most of these people, the numbers don't reflect that they're above average. It doesn't matter how much they make. It's the way they run things and the, how, where it's coming from and how they care about every, the, the intricacies of it. But most people, they don't understand business well enough to know that, hey, that's a, that's a Lamborghini, <laughs> not, a, not a Prius. <laughs> you know what I mean? But most people don't know that because they, they, they don't know it's supposed, you know what I mean? You look at it, you don't see any different, if that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that you wanted to talk about is, is, is uh, the level of uh, passion that Wonka had. Yeah, yeah. He's very passionate about his craft. And I think that that's what makes a great, uh, a great business. Like, where does that business, where you're like, how do you make the Lamborghini? Uh, you have to think, I want to be the Lamborghini in my craft. And then what happens is you go so deep on, like he did, he went so deep on the chocolate. And I don't think people realize, like, you have to go, what, how, they don't have perspective on when you say depth. What I mean by deep is you need to understand it so well. You understand what it's, what sells, what doesn't sell, what's premium, what's not premium, why, 
how to get financing for it. How you need to go not just in the product. You need to go deep, as Gary Vayner would say. He's like deep and wide, and you gotta go deep and wide, and then deeper and then wider, just infinitely, to the point where you expand whatever it is you do into the other dimensions, and the other dimensions being finance, being marketing, advertising, understanding, being able to serve, think beyond just in your in your room. Like when you go deeper on it, and you go beyond just internal, you start to expand into the external and how you can bring it to the world and to humanity. You gotta go so deep that you start to think like that. You start to think beyond yourself. But most people never reach those levels. But when you start to do it and it comes from this deep place like he did with chocolate and really, really trying to, you start to realize ultimately you're really trying to make something to serve to the, to the world. It ends up becoming legacy. If you want to have a high impact, positive legacy that you can share with the world, because most people don't go far enough into it to ever reach those levels. But if you did, the business you would make would be insane. Yeah. A lot of times, a lot of times, people don't know the difference between swag mm. and actually like like the found foundation below the swag. So it's like the, mm. they would just they would just because you you said. He was he was a uh, a positive about his craft. Yeah. He was excited about his craft. For sure. But a lot of times.